So I'm really not too sure if we're really talking about more like teacher preparation for licensure or um, professional development. Because you need to do both simultaneously. But they have a little, the one you don't need necessarily need to do in a structured institution, and the other has to do with licensure and has to go through some kind of accredited institution. I'm, uh, I'm going to try, for the most part, to focus in on preparing teacher for pre-service. Because we've had some tremendous uh, progress in that area. Uh, and I think it may provide with some uh, ammunition, if I can use that word, uh, to help you in your work. Because most teacher, accredit teacher preparation programs, number one, have to be accredited in our state. They're requiring that they be nationally accredited, but we've been able to get WINHEC to be our accrediting aid, uh, body, which is the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium, which is an international indigenous group. And they have a relatively uh, brand new pr process, been around for about a year now, uh, for accrediting teacher education. I just want to kind of lay that, and I put some slides in there. But I'm hoping what I'll be able to do is kind of give you a little background of how we moved into teacher education and um, what we've been doing, what models work for us, and then use what's useful for you. And then uh, we'll, we'll save some questions. Mikai? Okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with a bit of context. And I think, it's, I, I think this is really, really critical. And every person that becomes some kind of educator and advocate for your language, your olelo, needs to know a little bit about the history. You need to know from whence you come and where the struggles and where the issues were so that you can, one, see how far that you've gotten. Two, think of strategies of how to make them better. Three, understand why they are the way they are and why you have difficulty. Like I had some difficulty with my grandfather. I mean, as it turned out, I think his great-grandchildren were the love of his life. But it, it took him to go through the trauma and to reverse that experience because uh, he had more worry. So I mean, understanding history is really important. And this is sort of, in a nutshell, the most important pieces to me of our history. So the first is, is that we had an education system that was instructed t entirely through Hawaiian, which means we had math books, social study books, primary books, and we were not a written language traditionally, just like all of ours. You know, the missionaries came, created an alphabet, boom. And within 20 years, we had a huge high literacy rate. Did you, did you hear the number 100 newspapers? The number is actually a, about 125 that were um, for children topic. Uh, some of them were multi-language, like it'd be a column in French, a column in English, a column in Hawaiian. Some were only Hawaiian, but that's how they communicated. That was a social network technology of that day. And, and everybody wrote in them. They wanted to talk about issues over the newspaper, and that's how they did it. So we have those resources. Our novels were broken into chapters in issues of newspapers. So we have Shakespeare's literature and our own traditional literature. You know, we have civics. We have how to sew things, how to buy things. So all I'm saying is we had a repository of richness to go back to and see how they did it. What we needed to do is to figure out how do we gleam and take the best of that for a contemporary context. Because as you know, mathematics in the 1800 is not mathematics in the 1900 or in the, t in, in the year 2000. So we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to go and look and see what are the, the, the gems in our understandings and the way that our uh, elders taught that really, if you were to crosswalk them with all the big methodologies now that are that you're going to find that we have timeless practices. But we have to, too, get good at articulating that, because we've never had to before. It was the way you taught. It was the way you learned. And there were ways around that. But we need to get better at how to articulate, because people don't get that. And I think that has kind of helped to elevate some of our work as well, uh, probably around the umbrella of culture-based education 
and they're finding a lot, a lot of success around culture-based education, and I'll come back to that a little later. So we had our public education, uh, then it was abolished uh, three years after the overthrow of our government, of which became an official language in 1978, which makes 2018 its 40th year as an official language. In 83, that was on your flyer. We had about these many speakers at the very beginning when they were discussing what do we do with our language. This really is an indicator of it's dead. I mean, 32, uh, under the age of 18, that's not a strong indicator. So um, you really have to take a very strong stand and almost, in some ways, be kind of blinded to the kinds of challenges you can have. Because if you get bust up about it, you're not going to be able to deal with your language. You have to be able to take them as they come and deal with them as you're collected the best that you can. And there'll be errors around along the way, and there'll be successes. But over the long haul, you're going to find some beautiful gems that you didn't know that you had. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, 1986. So this is when the law came in. Uh, we removed the law from the books. And then it got uh, launched in public education. And then the Native American Language Act is important to all of us. And there's not enough implementation of that law. And I think we could all rally to support each other to get more support from the federal government to actually do more with what they have in that, in that law. So if you're not familiar with the uh, Native American Language Act, you might want to Google and just read a little bit about it. And then uh, 1997, our college got approved. It is very, I believe that it is the only indigenous language college, college, not department, in, in the nation. And that is a biggie, because colleges can create their own programs. You know, ed, teacher ed is usually housed under like College of Arts and Science, right? Something like that. Or sometimes you have College of Teaching. So we're able to do that, which allowed us to take a look at our language under this understanding. There are two official languages. There should be two official pathways to education. That is a strategy. So I say it again. Let's all say it together. There are two official languages. There should be two official pathways to education. So for you folks, there'll be, there are 20 plus uh, official languages. There should be 20 plus pathways. You know, the order and happens, it's going to happen naturally exactly what Pila said, where people are investing their energy in. So this has allowed us to create this whole total pathway. And we, uh, the state of Hawaii is a single state public system. It's the only of the 50 states that the lower ed and the higher ed is a state under the state umbrella. So, uh, but yet, newsflash, they still work very silo. So I think K-12 is getting a little bit better, but our a university system um, has a lot of work around that. But we just keep pushing the envelope. Because as long as we say we have two official languages, we have two official pathways to education, then we're starting to move in that way because our mindset is moving in that direction. So now, what does the college do for the upper division? All of our courses, second semester, second year above are conducted through Hawaiian, through Hawaiian. Um, what, we're tr what we've been piloting this year was um, World History 151, I think that's kind of a national number, and 152 taught in Hawaiian. So we're trying to get general core through Hawaiian. So as long as we can get the other disciplines to say, uh, we don't feel threatened for that, go ahead and try it. Um, we're not infringing on any of their major course territory. You know, usually, uh, general ed courses are taught by lecturers. They're not taught by your big do doctors. And you can have a bachelor's degree to teach. Anybody going to slap me? You can have a bachelor's degree to teach a general It happens in universities all the time. So what I'm saying is it's doable. And we're seeing more now the uh, early college, uh, early, uh, college movement they're starting to have high school teachers teach some of those general core, which actually opens the door even more for us, which means some of our high school teachers, potentially in those subject areas that are licensed in those areas, could teach general core. So you see what we're doing? We're trying to open up that access. 
training is going to have a link to all of that. And what is here? Our first graduate class graduates in 1999. And then the charter movement started. And a whole bunch of our schools, we have 17 charter schools. Uh, quite a few of them are what we call Hawaiian-focused charter schools, which are really the foundation is around the, co uh, the culture. And they have some language, but not a fluency goal. And then there are immersion charter schools. And the immersion charter schools popped out popped up in places where the, I want to say, the community as a whole felt that the school within the school wasn't working. Because many of our sites, school within a school was, is there were only so many classrooms. And that school had a few classrooms there. So you, so you would come under the, the principals, and, which is in a mainstream setting. So, for some principals that have taken initiative to learn the language and to find a space for both to reside happily uh, and to flourish their work, but mostly it's been very difficult. So, and then the, the statistics is on the right. Okay, so these are what the schools look like. If you wanna know how many schools we have, uh, we actually have 24 preschool to grade 12. Some are uh, full K to 12 sites, but the majority of them are kindergarten, middle, or secondary sites. So you can see the ones that we have lab schools for, they're in red. And yellow are the state, they call Papahana Kayapuni Hawaii, the state uh, DOE immersion schools, and then the Punana Leo and the Black Don. Just to give you an idea. Because that number, how many teachers do you think you're going to need for that kind of a number? 24. Mm -hmm. I think we have 161 and still a severe shortage. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that we're doing that I'm not really happy about, and I'm hoping it's going to be for a real short time uh, around a special permit that has been created. Uh, and if I have time, you can ask me again, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's not my preference. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see uh, find out what medium Oh, great. OK, so um, we're using Hawaiian medium slash immersion now to represent the diversity of the two models. And they have to do with the goal. So Hawaiian immersion is really the method. It's really the method. It's the immersion method. An immersion method could be done one hour a day, or it could be the whole day. You know, it's really the, and so, and if in Hawaii, we used immersion because it was a word that everybody was familiar with, because there are other language immersion kinds of schools in the country. And we didn't know a whole lot then of what to call that thing. Mm -hmm. So we, we went with the model, which is to immerse them in the language throughout the whole day. Um, but you do know that it's possible to do immersion in percentages as well, right? So, so we're talking now about the goal of immersion. So Hawaiian medium for us, the medium is the language that is being used. That's the through. And the goal of medium is to have a fully contained Hawaiian in language speaking environment, which means your office people uh, speak Hawaiian, your custodians speak Hawaiian, you're working towards increasing your numbers of families whose first language is Hawaiian in the home. It's just not in the classroom. So the goals are a little bit different. Um, and as you can guess, one model is a little bit easier to implement than another, because there are so many factors. Which one do you think is easier to implement? Yeah, immersion. Yeah, You, you really have to get buy-in for the medium, because it really cause, cause you to be much more of a language warrior. But that's where we've had the most success. The school that has the highest college entrance rate is a full Hawaiian medium environment. And they've been very successful. They test well in Hawaiian, and they're doing very well in their tests. Um, so that comes back to the quality of teacher preparation so that you can instruct and prepare students well. Are we good so far? OK, so where are we now? OK, so I have a proposal for you. And before talking about what a model might look like, I want to talk around these words that I call my re-words. Um, if you want to read a little bit more about it, uh, let's see, in my mother's voice, 
I wrote a small chapter on this. But it sort of sets the context for looking at teachers and the function and the role of teachers as nation builders. That with all the hours and time that they spend in formal education, that if they're working well with families and the communities uh, uh, in that whole connected piece, that in fact, they are preparing the next nation. They would be the leaders and the builders of tomorrow. And we want that change in our communities to be thinking a certain kind of way that I think is important for a teacher preparation that is an indigenous kind of teacher preparation. This is kind of my two cents with almost 40 years of experience in, uh, in the classroom and teaching. So I'm gonna just let you kind of read it real quick for just a few minutes. And then I'm just gonna highlight a couple things. <clears throat> I want you to pay attention to the last item that says resilient. Let me move the chair to <coughs> <laughs> ah, mahalo. Thank you. Now move your head. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you see in this that you think works from your experience of working with children? Can you highlight any that you think are really important? in the teaching of children. Because if children need to be taught that way, it's a skill that the teacher needs to have. Relevance. Relevance. We know lots about relevance. You know, I mean, don't teach me math with chipmunks, because we have no chipmunks. <laughs> you know, but if you're, you're gonna have pua'a or iole or something, I can get that because I see them, I relate to them. And that's kind of a human thing. But it's a really important strategy. Relationship. Relationship. I can't think of a more important indigenous strategy than relationship. And building relationship in learning is really important. In fact, in my, in my estimate for Hawaiian pedagogy, it is the first thing that you do. You don't start with the content if you, had, you haven't built a relationship with the learning. And the relationship has to have some kind of meaning to the student. So figuring out what that is is, the, is a big question. The school is not such a separate place from the home. Mm -hmm. Families are, are pulled in here in the community. Right. So, yes, community and family can be included in this. So, you know, when I went, went into the uh, classroom in immersion, I, had, I didn't care if they spoke Hawaiian or didn't. I, my doors were open, and I created a space for them because that relationship also sustained their commitment because they felt connected and they felt part of that whole movement. And they could see what was happening in the education of their children. I had, um, my last year I had five IEP students, which are special ed needs, special learner needs. <coughs> and they came in wanting to pull all five. And they brought this team from, I don't know, the state office to come and evaluate. And when they finished, they said, this, these children are better off here. They, they're loved, they're accepted, they're excelling, because so, these kinds of things were happening. And part of that, that um, the strategy is that I didn't do it isolated, that the parents were my team. In fact, how I knew I had that many is I had some of these parents go have the kids test, because the teacher can't ask for the student to be tested. The parent has to ask that. that was, that's the rule in Hawaii. So I'd say, and it's not about saying your child's got a learning difficulty. I want to know how I can help your child better. That's my job. And that's my care and aloha for your child. So really having that kind of attitude, um, some of these skills you can teach, and some you can empower the way people feel about teaching and learning, because they're part of a really great thing in revitalizing their language, that it's important to them. That's why they're coming into it in the first place. Sure. So I've been a principal now um, for four years, and one of the things that, I mean, we're missing the revitalizing language piece, but any of the mm -hmm. native teachers that we have pretty much all do and get like all the rest. Like it comes naturally, and one of the things that I've been struggling with is how to, you know, articulate it and say, 
the difference between our native teacher classrooms and our non-native teacher classrooms are usually in the um, fact that all these are just embedded and it just feels natural and easy. Um, You're really fortunate because there's, you know you can actually you you can do this in a very Western lens yes, as yeah. well. Yeah. So um, you know part of it is a community question, knowing the community, the nature of the community. Part of it for us, all of us, is how to leverage these strategies as part of a larger strategy to revitalize your language. Well, and that, I mean that's what I've been struggling with: is how do I help um, spread that? I mean, you know, some of the teachers that are non-native that have been there beyond six years. You know, they're starting to fill these in and incorporate those, um, but how we can help bridge that gap for everybody so that it's not just something we do because we're Native people and grew up in the village and you know, mm -hmm. know how to relate, but to, to actually talk about these things so that we can mm -hmm. have everybody do it more naturally. Um, it actually takes more work, yeah. and unfortunately, it takes more work on your teachers. Yep. <laughs> and it takes work on the principal to set that stage. Yep. You know, so having them actually feel more open to learning language and to be part of the solution in that school environment, that will change too. But it, it also, that's a bit of a struggle, I'll be honest, because the teachers already have more to do than the others. And then too, now they've got to help to, to to improve that whole learning environment. But I think in the long run, it, it actually is very helpful. We've had those that have actually switched from, and they become our, our strong allies, but it takes patience to do that because you've got to put in that extra. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to you know, add that it's so nice to see this all laid out and it'll help because we can do it it'll help bridge some of the gaps with our non native teachers in our schools. Mm -hmm. and help articulate what our native teachers who are, you know, and it's still a minority. We have very few native teachers in our schools, but I think this comes real quickly and naturally to our, to the people who feel called to come into our schools. I mean, it's usually these exact mm -hmm. reasons that bring us in and want, yeah. want to work through the system. So I Mahalo. Mahalo. You have a question? Um, I just wanted to, um, Make a comment on her um, comment um, on how to do this. Um, <clears throat> our school district, the Northwest Arctic, they have the um, the C3 camp, where every um, first year teacher that comes into our district is required to go to that camp, and it's a week long camp, and it's out um, at a camp. It's not in any of the villages. Um, they go to the camp and they learn about our lifestyle, they learn about our values, um, they learn about our food and how our kids act, um, not in a school setting. Um, and so um, the Humanities Forum is the one that runs all of this. So they have all kinds of grants. Um, they've been doing that for about six, five or six years now. And so they give the monies to um, the tribal councils, and the tribal councils will be able to hire um, their own people to run that camp. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted you to know about that. You know, one of the simple things that, um, that seems to work, especially for people who are around the about crowd, is to create celebrations and rituals in your school environment that invite and create space for everybody. So it's very common in uh, both Hawaiian immersion, uh, medium and immersion schools to have protocol before they come into school and everybody lines up in a designated place. Usually the, the um, men are on the right and the women are on the left and there's a protocol way of entering. Some schools, some of these schools within schools have now have the whole school doing that. So trying to find kind of safety, safe ways to bring them in that they feel like they're starting to come into the movement. Uh, but you know, um, schools, especially elementary schools, do celebrations all the time. Secondary schools, we have to be thinking about rites of passage, you know, uh, and how do we do that? Um, so there are ways to, I think, 
soften up the environment to make it a little bit more uh, encouraging. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna offer up uh, and share the model that we've created in Hawaii. Our um, university, U University of Hawaii at Hilo campus has two teacher education programs. It is a mainstream program under the College of Arts and Science and we battled to have the other one under us. And you know, of course their argument was, we train teachers, we can train your teachers. But our argument was, you have no background in how to think about pedagogy and, and, and instructing that through our language. And we have actually been doing these all these years. We need to be the ones to do that. So what we did is we created um, two separate programs that feed upon one another. So sometimes you'll, and these are both graduate. It started as a post back and we moved it to graduate so that we could move the credits from this program into this program. Does that make sense? So just to get them out with their initial teacher licensure, and when they're ready to continue, because sometimes they're just, our teachers are all in baby bearing age. So it's either they're coming in, somebody's coming in pregnant, or somebody's going out <laughs> pregnant. You know, while they're trying to, to train to become a licensed teacher, they're exhausted. Our work is our, the first semester I call boot camp. You know, then we send them home to their home community. All the other programs, they, uh, they do their, their student teaching for about a month. Our teachers do two semesters of full student teaching. Tell me why we would have such a stringent requirement. Why would we have one that stringent? Yeah. We need to be in it with guidance in order to really be successful. The bulk of them, we have now immersion children coming in. Immersion graduates, they're far from children. Their parents have children of their own. Some are teenagers, even. That uh, we have those that have that experience, but the bulk have not had that experience. So they need, and, and four years of Hawaiian, like four years of any other language, I'm going to guess, is similar to Hawaiian. You didn't learn science terms, social studies terms, math terms. You don't know how to articulate that strategy. And how about the abstractions? in some of our content areas. That was an experience you most likely had in four years of Hawaiian. But you have enough of your foundation in what you learn in your grammar and structure to be able to build from there. So we want them in with others so they get more modeling. Because once they're by themselves, we can't guarantee if they have any kind of support with them. So it allows us to give them that support in a full student teaching experience over two semesters. So the first, um, the first certificate is built on four years of language. Yeah, there are requirements degree, that they need to have. A bachelor's degree in, a in something. Language or anything. Right? They, uh, they could come in with anything, uh, but they have to have four years of Hawaiian and X number of culture courses. That's part of the foundation. And all of our students take a course, it's a one credit course that we call 490, which is actually a proficiency exam. It's like preparing for the SAT. So you know, you've got your writing, your listening, your, so there's five sections of that. And we meet with them five times to kind of prepare them for that section, and then they take the test. All of our bachelor's students have to do that in order to get their BA. And that's been sort of our quality control measure, and it is a, a uh, prerequisite to coming into our teacher ed. So we know that they have, they're coming into us with a certain amount because we need to elevate that mm -hmm. in multiple contents. And, you know, I just, I can't tell you the complexity. I mean, even kindergartners ask just difficult questions. Mm -hmm. But once you're trying to get into, uh, I don't know, statistics, we have one of our math teachers that's a Hawaiian studies minor, <laughs> a linguistics major and a math major and he's teaching statistics to our students at, at Navahi. So I mean that's what they need to have uh, under their belt. So this is three semesters, 37 credits, they begin during the summer then fall and spring semester. They can apply to continue into our masters and we did this, we did this to be responsive to the needs of teachers. So they come to us for two years these credits transfer in here to graduate with only one course, so three credits. And they do that over 
uh, over distance learning so that they don't have to move. So we can help elevate their, their skill and their practice as both educators and researchers at that master's level, they do an action research project. So it's not a thesis A. So what we want them to do is to find something they want to study and research. Because the point is that good teachers are also good researchers. And they can do it in our language too, as a skill. So we want them to choose. So they've chosen math questions. One, one of them that I really liked uh, created something she called Kipa uh, Kauhale, where she actually created a process she wanted to find a better way to uh, have a closer communication with the parents. So she created this visiting before the school started. And she'd take you know, sort of her plan, her philosophy. She'd go to the house, take something to the house, sit meet with the family. Well, you can guess her problems with communicating with parents down. The problems with behavior problems that the students had doubt because the children are all on mute. If I come home and Kumu says, you know, Kumu's got the, the, the red line direct to my cell phone, I mean, that the communication was much better. So she did that. Um, we uh, recently, this uh, last class actually, we instruct English literacy skills at fifth grade. They don't get English literacy skills like a content course until fifth grade. And she did hers in sight words sight words and com uh, comprehension. So the, uh, the idea is to help them within that environment to add to the research, to add to the practice, but mostly to elevate the quality of their practice as educators and researchers. So these are all directions that we can go. Um, I don't know what's wrong with this. It's acting funny. So. Um, I don't know if any of you sat in on um, Larry's presentation yesterday. He talked about our philosophy statement. This philosophy statement was created in 1998, the year, no, no, 1997 in the fall, um, the year before we started our Kahua Viola program as a pilot. And um, it was something that uh, a small delegation uh, I include, I led that delegation, went and visited different teacher education programs in Aotearoa, the ones that were recommended as the best of the teacher education programs. And we went to visit them. And what we found, and of course, for every support, there's going to be a different argument. So um, for the most part, we found that the schools that were using Te Aho Matua, that philosophy, how many of you have heard that, Te Aho Matua? You might want to Google it. There's a translated version. They use that to, uh, as, a, as the founding, the foundational philosophy that guides the development of Kura Kaupapa. So that would be your elementary schools. And they have moved that into policy in, in their parliament now. So they actually get funding for those kinds of schools. But the linking of the development of those kind of models with the kind of preparation that teachers need for those kind of models. And to have a, more of a clarity, it's like a vision. You want to have a collective understanding about where you're going. The philosophy sets some agreements about what you think and believe about how you're going to do your work. So we actually met, there's about nine of us. I'm, I'm so sorry. This is, I'll just close this for a minute. Maybe it'll get better. Um, we met over several months, several months to, uh, we had a native speakers with us, parents who had been involved with the movement, some university, we thought a really good committed group to talk about what would be that kind of driving philosophy for us. And um, I'm going to guess, because I've seen some of your values posters, that you probably already have a head on that. You know, for many of your languages, it's what you do with that now. How do you apply that in practice? So uh, we did what everybody should do. We went back to our old knowledge, because that's where the answers are for. That's where the answers about the philosophy of our, of our people is. And that's, that illustration is how we came up with those three pillars around the moli, which is your life force, and how you develop and nurture and foster that moli, and then the environments that you walk through with your life. It's like 
early childhood education or ed psych, beginning of ed psych, but in an indigenous way. And the three picos of the connection uh, of the body, and now how that connects to how we develop curriculum, how we train teachers, but it gave us a foundation that we could all work from. And it's been really helpful for us. Is it like the value that we have today? Um, I would say it's imbued with very strong values, but we actually put a language to how we see all of those working together. Um, it, if you want to, the document is in Hawaiian, Spanish, Japanese, English. We've tra had it translated. And uh, you could get on Google and type in um, Te Ahuma, uh, excuse me, Te Akumuhonua Mauliola, and you can pull up the document if you're interested in looking. It's on the web. I don't know what's wrong with this. Yeah, mahalo. That's something blue, so. How's our time? Well, maybe if I have time, I can show them where it is. Yeah, I don't either. It's a sign that we're all supposed to eat lunch. <laughs> the cables. We checked the cables. Well, it's not blinking now. It doesn't continue not to blink. Okay, so remember I talked to you about going back to your own practices. I really feel like I'm talking to the choir because I've seen some of your work. You use your own practices. And it's amazing how many of those old, timeless, indigenous, traditional practices are some of the best strategies for educating that's in current research. If you cross work, that's what you will find. So. Um, this is what we use at ours. You know, it used to be people said, oh, you know, when you makahana ka ike, you know, learning comes from doing. Oh, that means that Hawaiian children only learn if they can touch it. So they, the strategy you work with them is tactile. That's not what that means. This means that I've got to apply their learning and have them perform and exhibit their learning in multiple ways. It doesn't mean that tactile learning is the only. See, they don't get it, but we would get that because we have those practices in, in play. So really using your, your own practices to help develop leadership and the whole idea of teaching and learning because of course, teachers learn as much as they do teach and so do students. See, students teach us and they also learn from us. So these for us in our language is the same word. I used a couple different, but this is really the word ao and that's the word ao. So this is ao, ao mai, and aoaku. It's just a direction. And then this whole idea about reflecting on practice. Um, one of the works that um, we have had some really good progress is around some of our cultural standards. And I really have to, uh, if you didn't know this, uh, Lottie, can you remind me if I got the year wrong? It was in 1998, around there. The year that the Alaskan Knowledge, Na Native Knowledge Network did their book on language, that standards and book, there are nine of us that came up that year. And so if you look in the book, you will see we're accredited or cited is the word for participating in the development of that. But our reason for coming up here was to figure out how it was that you were getting consensus. With so many groups and languages, how are you getting consensus that you could put your standards down in a book? Because we were doing a lot of battling, you know? It's, I mean, that community is this and this. And that's part of the healing process, yeah? Is you have to kind of find your way and you, okay, we can work together on this. It's part of the healing process. So when we went back, we created a, the first edition of this called um, Naho Nur Moniola. The first edition had 16 guidelines. Um, I want to say guiding principles. 
And if you were a practitioner that was really embedded in Hawaiian understandings, you really got it. But if you were an about teacher, it was really hard. And so seven years later, we met, and we pulled the conceptual ideas that came out of each one of those um, guiding principles and came up with what we call na'a ala ike, which are nine knowledge banks. Mm -hmm. And we envis put envisioning statements around them. Is what do we envision for each one of these pieces? Because to us, each of these pieces are part of the how mm -hmm. we begin to address the indigenous way that we educate. And, and so that we can attend to the wholeness in our children. Because I really believe part of our work is about well-being. It's a big part of our work. It's a big, big part of our work. So this is how we kind of, that's how we get there. If you type this in Google, the pamphlet is there. And the second edition that is in the process of being printed is there. So you can have access to that. So just the clarification, the Alaska Rural Systemic Initiative Project, mm -hmm. which many were involved in here, versus the website, Alaska Native Knowledge Network. It's different. So from that grant funded project, these collaborative meetings where the parents were saying, we would like our high school students to graduate knowing this of the language and culture, mm -hmm. and those themes came up, mm -hmm. and therefore the cultural standards. Right. So we took the next step, and we took each one of these. When you Google it, you will see the book's about 260-something pages. But we've taken each one of these cultural pathways that have an envisioning statement and also have the how. And the, each one of them is in a chapter beginning with, of course, traditional understandings with an explanation of what that means, because we're trying to reach a broader access to support that. Then what follows that is the five, um, five groupings of stakeholders and how you would implement each one of those strategies for the stakeholders. So that would be the learner, the, the teacher, the family, the school and institution, and the community. And so you can, and it's not totally comprehensive. I say it's a beginning list, but it gives you an idea of how you may take that and what you might do as kind of a benchmark of a strategy to deliver that pathway. And as you could guess as you look, most of ours don't have one pathway. You can't do the language pathway without doing a bunch of others. So um, I, I think it works pretty good. And then uh, in addition to that, we created URLs of all kinds of resources, videos, curriculum, that would help provide resources, online resources, for those um, nine pathways. And then reading material, because a lot of people really they think culture is just a kind of a simple thing, but it really can be quite complex. You need to kind of have, there's a way of talking about that. So if you want access, and this all came out of our work with Hawaiian Medium. That as we went deeper into preparing, so did we have to take another layer and take another layer, because we couldn't just do the Western thing. We had to create the way in which we do our strategies and prepare our teachers. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the crucial part for you guys is um, having them in the language, conveyed in the language, versus using English like we do here. Oh, only Hawaiian. Yeah. Right. And there's so many things that the language saves you from having to explain like you do in English. Mm -hmm. You get, because the language already has, is already embedded the context of that thinking. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how are we on time? How are we on time, gang? Can I ask a quick question? Sure. I don't know, you might open up um, your something else. We have 40 minutes, OK. You mentioned two English <coughs> and Hawaii to, okay. to include both. So how much of translation were you doing um, in the beginning? Was there or was there no oh. translation? I'm sorry, would you ask that question one more time? Um, you know, but in bilingual education, you mentioned that English, both English and Hawaiian are both important in learning mm -hmm. for your children. Um, so how much of translation was going on from the indigenous pedagogy, the original path, 
defining the pathways. Um, um, for this document in particular, it was written in Hawaiian and then translated into English. We're, we finally have the skill now that we can actually do that. I'd say the beginning years, we're still trying to find our voice and the how you do these things. And because we're trained in the other, you can write in the other and you end up translating. But it always falls short. So as our skills were getting better, so are our abilities now to do it through our language. I'd say that's an honest comment. Okay. So right now you're saying you're immersing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Our teacher ed program is taught solely through Hawaiian. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't print it, so I don't even know what's next. So ask me some questions while we're at I forgot what comes next. I think what I want to give you is some hope of possibility, and I hope some courage, because it's a, it's a tough fight at the institution that has been used to, to preparing teachers out of a mainstream program, because they have to give up. It's like giving up that they're not in expertise in something because educators feel that what they offer is good for all. Um, it's more of a, uh, just to mention, mm -hmm. um, I did not know how much people before us fought for our language to be taught in institutes and in schools. You know, I, I thought it was like, you're, it's a native um, Yupik community, so Yupik will be taught in this. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like that. Um, and then um, this week I find out even in the immersion schools, they're still struggling mm -hmm. to um, use uh, what they need to teach. Yes. And that that's so awful. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are policies, procedures, or whatever they call them, bylaws, that in each school um, that our language will be taught, but if they're not focused in it. Whoever is running, you know, the people with um, higher power are not um, focusing on the need. Mm -hmm. And the teachers are the only ones that are fighting, and I guess we need more of a community um, so, strength to... I think amongst the group who has, as a group, who has the strongest amount of power in schools are parents. Yeah. The laws can say your children will take these, the students will take these, but parents can say, I won't allow it. That's allowed in law, <coughs> even though they choose it. There has to be an out. By, by law, there has to be an out, and parents have the right to, yeah, to turn down testing. You know, in each village, there's uh, a board of parents within every school. Okay. And I guess they're really, I don't know what they talk about. But I, I'm not from a village, I'm from Anchorage. So um, I'm, I was really bummed. I even cried. Yeah. Because all these things are written who, and to be um, taught and nobody's focusing mm -hmm. on them. So, My grandkids are going to lose it, lose the language. Mm -hmm. So your families are your best allies. That is a skill that we need to teach our teachers. Because we can't assume that because they're teachers, they know how to do that. And for our work, it's really critical. We get movement because we, we move as, as, as a group. And, you can't, and a teacher does not have enough. It's an awful big stress to walk that path by yourself. But when you're walking with other families, and it's a change in your mental thinking about language. So you've got to now make decisions based on what's best 
for the child in the model that you've chosen for the child. That is different sometimes than what policies are dictating or what tests and things children need to have. So we've had to do that a lot to ensure that the, the quality of what we're giving them still through our lens, because it's very easy to stand in front of a classroom and, and hear Hawaiian, but not see a Hawaiian classroom. It's possible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it means we have to change a lot of thinking about how they think about teaching, how they think about an, uh, a, a positive, supportive environment for our language. And therefore, other policies may come in line or they may not. And when they don't, for the best interests of moving your language forward with your children, your parents are your best allies. That's what we have found. But then, you know, I come from that, so I'm a firm believer in, par in parents and families. Anybody have another question? Hi. Yeah, um, I work in a little bit of a different situation where I work with an after-school program, and I'm a trained educator. Mm -hmm. um, although we have, um, I guess I would call them cultural knowledge bearers that are teachers for mm -hmm. our after-school program. And I was wondering if you might have any suggestions, because it's like, <laughs> I think that if you're a passionate, um, trained educator, like it's hard for me to find that line with recognizing, you know, I'm not training them to, I'm not preparing them to be teachers, but I want to give them the best skill set that they can for working with students. Is it in an immersion site or is that the only immersion experience that they get? No, I'm actually attending because we do want to um, integrate language into our programming um, because it's been minimal, very minimal, just words, like words of the day or, or different things like that um, with our programs. And so I'm looking to integrate more language. How large is, is the um, participation? How many students do you have in that? We see anywhere from, it, it ranges throughout the school year because it's an after school program, but it ranges anywhere from 25 to, I think we serviced just under 100 total this last school year. Are you by yourself or you have eight? Do you have eight? No. no. Oh, that's tough. Um, to be honest, the thing that you have to do is create that language environment. You, it, within the walls or the grounds or the space, mm -hmm. you have to create a safe language environment mm -hmm. to make errors, to grow with. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you need to do. Um, I know our after-school program, they pretty much, they, we, we bring in university students to come attend to the after-school uh, after program, and they help them with their homework. It's actually great with them, because their Hawaiian gets better as they're mm -hmm. helping the children with their homework. But you would pro I'm thinking that you would probably be doing a, sort of a cross between the of and the through, because there's not a whole lot of time to do a lot of immersion time to get them to learn their language really quickly, like a full-on immersion or medium, but it doesn't mean it couldn't be done. Some sc schools have done that. And are, they're trying that sort of their medium entrance test zone to get it in the door. They want the, their students to have something but not be an immersion site. So it's, um, I, I, I don't think it's as effective because there's not enough hours, yeah. critical hours in the day. Mm -hmm. But um, it's better than the zero, right? Yes. And, it, and you can make some leeway. And part of that is opening up their attitude about language, about learning language. So I, it's probably not a place that they do a, only homework. It's probably a place where they learn songs and dances mm -hmm. and make things yes. with their hands all through the language. So it has lots of contextual clues just by the nature of what it is you're teaching. Okay, let's go on. So <clears throat> this is um, called the Muenaha. It's a method that I created and it's the method, we only teach one soul method. Our students don't learn about any of the great philosophers and theorists, uh, Western theorists. This is what they do. They learn through our traditional practices and I've created a system to
to help teachers develop their lesson plans and their unit plans. So the system is about helping them with their thinking to be able to do lesson plans in that kind of light that we want. So what I have actually, you see the words there, the four R's? This is what I think is our native process for teaching. And um, I'm just, it, it can be more complicated how you actually do that. But in very simple terms, the process is like this. You've got, there's, I, I believe that there is always a bigger idea and a learning in our traditional thinking because it's connected to bigger things. And so the, the entrance in here is connecting them to those, that big idea of the learning. And then the relevance of that particular content of skill and the application of that in various ways and the performance of that in a way that is a, a student exhibit of performance. Uh, I think we do that naturally. I think this works really well for us. We can look at the nature, like the pictures that you have there are just the process of the whole nature of the kukui plant, which is our candle nut. It's where we get our, uh, our oil to make light from. But just in our language, those ideas are embedded. That first comes the kupu, the sprouting of the knowledge, and then the beginning of the shoots to liko. And you see that healthy plant, and then the flowers to begin to bloom that create new seeds that drop and create new trees. I mean, I think the indicators are all there in our nature, and we're used to that. And part of our challenge is getting back to some of that through our language and our cultural lens. But um, I, I created an electronic system so that they can actually publish and share their units and their lesson plans across with each other. Um, it's been a growing project, but it's sort of the thing that I want to retire leaving because I think what we need is more tools. You know what I shared with you at the beginning with all those re's? They're great to think about, but the question is how do you do it? What does it look like? And how do you help teachers with tools so that they can do what they're trained to do best? And still make sure that it's embedded and grounded in a way that is, comes from the lens of our language and culture. So this is my attempt. I've seen other things that you folks have done. I've seen, I was telling Lolly last night about some great, uh, and Lolly would know who this is. Uh, it's a video I saw about teaching math through the measurement of the cusp. You know, and so why is that not any better, if not better, than the chipmunk stuff? Because there's so much thinking that has to come and purposeful in, in, in the work and the intent of the product. So all those other things about the quality, uh, personal investment because of that connection in learning. So I think we just maybe do it a little different, but I think we are just as effective if not more. So I would encourage you to maybe think about what are some of those processes. And I, mean, I can think of some of the strategies. One of our big one that's in the process is memorization. That's big for our people because we didn't originally have a written language. So, I mean, the Kumulipo was over 3,500 lines. And there were people that memorized all of that. They were uh, great storytellers. And they were the people that maintained the genealogy of the chiefs. I'm going to guess that not everybody was born with the skill to memorize. But for our people, memory was an important thing. I, I could tell you where that goes in here. And it can go in several places. It's a strategy. But we still have a process with multiple strategies that are indigenous to us, our ways of doing that. And we just need to go back and look at them and then revive them a little bit. Does that make sense? Um, how's our time? 20 minutes, OK. I think uh, what I want to do, this, this one is uh, going to focus a little bit more on our teacher ed program. And I kind of like this. The reason why I put this one in is our teacher ed program, our pre-service program, is called Kahua Viola. And if you look at the language, you know the language just speaks to you, Kahua Viola. And the word hua is the fruit or the product of something. And the word for value and wealth comes, is vai vai, it comes from the word vai. And all is the word for life. 
But if you put some of the words together through that process, the word kahua down there is a word for foundation. The word for hua here is the coming of the whole piece. And the um, hua vai is, is the um, receptacle, the water gourd itself. So the water gourd is actually symbolic for the container of the whole person, like containing your knowledge. I just, you know, look, languages are so nice. They couldn't do it like that in English, but you hear it in Hawaii, you go, oh my gosh, it's got so many deep meanings in it. And you can see how it kind of touches thinking in, uh, in your values in preparing teachers. So that's the name of our program. This is just some information uh, about our program, of which I already talked about. Uh, rigorous and experimental performance-based assessments. We've created some really good assessments for teacher preparation that are in our language and using our own value and skill sets. Um, that has taken us a while to do because we actually have had to do it enough years to feel like we kind of understand what we're doing. Because we're recreating something that hasn't been done for generations you know, in a formal setting, taking traditional understandings in a formal setting. Um, a cohort model, our expertise, all of our faculty currently and our mentors um, all come from immersion and the bulk of them all have children that they put through immersion. The commitment is really high, the practicum. So this picture at the back shows, um, I think this is of our last graduating class and all of the support that they had. So this was their graduation. But the point was that our children don't, our children, our teachers don't come in a program as isolated students. They come in with their community and their family and it takes that support to train them. Um, just some alignment issues around, okay, so this is some of the good stuff. This is the usual stuff for, for teacher accreditation and licensing. They've got to have pedagogical knowledge and teaching skills, right? That's the stuff, the teacher skills. They've got to have some cultural and professional dispositions. Usually it's called professional dispositions, but we have to make sure that that's part within that. And then, of course, the academic content knowledge, math, science, reading. But we also have to have this layer. And what has been really interesting and really lucky for us is we got our teacher standards board. Oh, wait, I'm going to come back to that. These are the poly. So these are the process that they come into us and exit. So uh, the prerequisites that they have to have, the foundation courses during the summer, it's a five week intensive. It's the only time that they come to us intensive like that. They come on site with us. When we started, they had to resident with us, and I had to stay there for that long as well. It used to be six weeks. Then they're clinical, they go back to their communities fall and spring semester, and we do seminar over technology, and, um, and then uh, graduation. So trying to get them into the employment line, but the truth is that our teachers are, I want to say 97% of the time already hired before they've graduated because we've got a teacher shortage. And they, they really like our teachers. So these are the program goals. Do you notice how they align with the Nahonua Moliola? So we went back to those. So if those are things we need to prepare them to be doing in school, so do we need to fig figure out a way to align them for, for professional development. Professional development for teacher certification. Um, it's on the web if you want to look and read more slowly later. I just wanted to give you a quick point. Okay, so this is the license. <clears throat> the standards board finally said we have to have good standards for immersion. It's too long. We don't have them. Elementary standards are not doing it. We, we just not, we're missing the point and the mark on some things your teachers need to be prepared for. So they gathered, uh, I want to say, about half a dozen of us. And they allowed us to uh, write those things in Hawaiian, of which we translated in English. So these are basically just a summary. And then I put the English of those sections so you can see how they match to the scores that I just showed you in the previous slide. So for us to talk about what is makaukaupono, we got to, it's a really good discussion. What does that mean for our language? And 
are teachers that are also cultural practitioners. Um, and it looks short, but there's some really deep understandings in here. Um, this is a first for us. So along with that, our standards board passed a, um, they passed a policy after much work. So I'm saying this because if Hawaii's done it, maybe it might help you as you are ready to think about getting, having your own immersion or UPIC medium standards for your teacher education and then your process for accreditation because your teachers cannot be certified unless they're accredited. All 50 states are like that. So we went to them, we actually went to TIAC. Those of you that do teacher training know TIAC and then there's NCATE and you might have something else here in this state. And we, we talked to them and they said, no, we have our process and you will do our process. We have our rubrics of what we think are good programs and you must, and so we went into very assertive conversation with our standards board and showed them how they were so disaligned that it was being irresponsible to accredit a program to prepare teachers in a way that weren't being trained for the program models itself. Mm -hmm. And so they uh, approved uh, WinHEC to be a provider. And so this is out of the uh, goals from WinHEC. And goal four is around accreditation. So if you want to know more and you get on winhec.org, I think, there's an accreditation link. And you can go scroll down and it says indigenous uh, teacher education and see what that process is like. It's built on a very indigenous platform. So before you talk about any of the usual accreditation stuff, like the organization, who's your faculty? Um, how is it budgeted? Uh, what do your content of your courses look like? Before you do any of that, you have to lay out your schema for what is indigenous about what you do. So your philosophy, your values, and your beliefs, and you have to say, this is what we believe for us is, uh, is indigenous for our work. And this is how we've aligned it for preparing teachers. Mm -hmm. So that the look at all of these things, the faculty, the budget, the blah, 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 is all weighed against this. And no other accreditation will do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for us because we don't want to be accredited and forced to do things that we know isn't a good direction for preparing teachers. So um, it, we've been able to open that. Maybe you folks might be able to take advantage of that as you do what you need to do with your own professional licensing boards. Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna play a short video um, these are, I think, four of our students um, that are going to talk a little bit about their experience in Kahua Viola. And the reason why they were chosen is one is an immersion or a Hawaiian medium student that came up the ranks from Punana Leo. One is a, came in the regular entrance that college students come in. One came in as a parent wanting to, to be a speaker and a leader in their own family and ended up becoming a teacher. And the last one is somebody for many years came back to language and actually comes from a very strong Hawaiian community. So these are their words. <laughs> He's now at the state office responsible for developing a brand new social studies curriculum in Hawaiian, the text all in Hawaiian. Okay. 
kumu mauli ola Hawaii, dihe ko na mau pahu wapu me ko u na ko u ola a tala bo i mau ola Hawaii ini doa ni pahu i kumu mauli ola Hawaii. Ua mau pahu ya u ka hua wai ola ke kai anu u e ko mau ai ke kamata e maki maki ana e ko i ke mau pahu wapu i me na awa u Hawaii i me e ko pua Hawaii. Nah ni ada ke orang yang tahu maka aku kele nak umbar makua iya aku nula ina lari bau ikela ekonomi papa nak iya aku anak ina nak kembali kembali. Oke kahibian nui mau bahu oh na na mea eh oh na awal way ina keki ana makau liki orang yang tahu no no nui bau i kelo nui. Hemian nui kahol lo hek makawa. Oke, mami kawai iya u wapili lo ika piko. Oke piko u ayak mea iki ayi kapo e iko pili ko ano ame ko pili mai na kupu na ahi kilo iki ya. Oke, mami kawai he he ahu vale ina he mami kawai ko ke kanapa he ahu vale he olor kawai ika makula. Paa ke kai mohana no e au ya ya, paa na kule ana ko e ke ku una ya ya, a paa kana lo bena he Hawaii, a lo a kona mo au au, a nui a hu vale ka au au lo bena ke kanaka, a o ka pili u hane nui kona mo au au ke kahi he mahalo ya he mahalo ina mana o ke au. O ya ko u ko na i ke, a pehe a bau e no no wai. Pehe a wau e hanai, hanalimai, i nga mea nike o le a pau, i loko o le a pau, i waho o le a pau. Those are kindergarten students. Kwa hana ki ia e wai wai hoa e kouma, e ike a e kouma kau. No laila, kono e ikai ka mana au au a pau. I don't know what happened, sorry. Me ali hi ke makau, i ke komo wale ana ea, komo a hana. No ka lilo ana i kumu mau mi hawai i. Uh, What do you see similar amongst all of them? You see, what do you see resonating? They all come from different experiences into the program. They all have passion. Strong voice. A humbleness. That comes from portraying them through our language and culture. That's what I believe. Yeah. So. It's not a job. And they probably would all tell you that. And they're not, they didn't grow, not all of them grew up with Hawaiian. Some of them started at the university level. But you couldn't really even tell that, could you? So I, you know, if we had this video, we really got to do an updated one. But, but I think it makes the point, you know, that we, we really are the best ones to do the training. And it really sends us into many new areas of discovery that helps to better inform our work. And I think it's a really important place and it's also carving indigenous space in these institutions where um, they have the total right to be carved. So. Did you guys ever run into this when you were kind of getting started? We have quite a few folks who are, there's not very many of us who are achieving this level of fluency yet, but when they do, I say, you gotta go teach. No one was like, I don't want to be a teacher. And I say, that's just what you've got to do right now so we can sort of build this thing. Did you guys have to push people into that profession? Um, I want to say we gently and not so gently guide them there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, part, and, and part, I think part of it is one of the most impactful places to be as a speaker is in the classroom, and speakers know that. And they also know that they do that every day by working directly with students. And there's still a limited number 
of, of people that are good enough, proficient enough in the language to do that. So I think that I hear a lot more often that I have I need to teach because I have a responsibility at this point, this is what I need to do. But not everybody wants to go there. But for the most part, we've been able to maintain our numbers. And if they're not being maintained, they're being picked up by Kamehameha schools. I was telling them, you, you folks need to help fund our programs because you guys are picking up our people. So if you want to, you need to help us train more because the schools are more important than your culture offices. So, I mean, they pay way better than the public school does. I but, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I think one of the ways to, one of the barriers um, that would make people feel that way is the sense that they're going to have to teach the Western way. That they're going to have to stand in front of a chalkboard. I mean, and even at, those people are probably thinking chalkboard, um, you know, lines, and, and to be able to give that permission that when we have you do this, you'll do it your way. I mean, you'll do it in a way that feels more right to how you just learned. Um, That's a that, great point, and you're so right about that, because know. it actually sends the passion that they have is being fed, because it's, yep. it's in a way that is in a line with the language and the culture. I Thank you. That that, you're totally right about that. Barrier is that I can't <coughs> teach that way. Right. But you know, if you're allowed to go in and learn the way you teach, the way you learn, that we're not going to be restricted to the compartments. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That they'll be more compelled and inclined to be willing to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would ask where you are yet with the language immersion teacher preparation program. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at your process where you. This is a requirement before they come into your, um, it's a two and a half year program, I guess, the four semesters and two. Our um, masters, oh, okay. our masters. Our uh, teaching certificate is three semesters, one year. So they start in the summer mm -hmm. with all of their uh, foundations course and then fall and spring in the classroom. So for us, we have the schools and college of ed, you know, now one um, under one umbrella. So do they, do you have a, a Western, you know, teacher prep program? They go through there and then to your program? Nope. Okay. We have two teacher ed programs. Those that want mainstream teacher training go to the College of Arts and Science. Those that want to do Olelo come to Kahakaula. Is that four-year degree requirement before they go into your yeah, Because program? it is a, a graduate. Yeah. And, you know, we fiddled around with that, mm -hmm. but the truth is they really don't become at the level of proficiency to our thinking without four years of Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Because even within four years, there's a range, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them could be four years, but closer to the second semester of third year. So that's why we have this proficiency exam. Mm -hmm. We just need to, we need to help students get there. Mm -hmm. And students also need to know that their proficiency matters. And we had to work that out. I, that's another thing. We had to, we started with, it's a graduate requirement out of Kahua Viola. And then as we built capacity, we moved it to an entrance requirement. It scared people at the beginning. Thank you for that. And the last one is for WinHEC, uh, the World Indigenous Nations Higher Ed Consortium. Mm -hmm. Uh, for their accreditation uh, for Alaska. Collectively, we've got these you know, different cultural regions, and I don't know the rep representation requirement at the board level. So I don't think we have an INFAC or a UFIC or a FINFIC or, you know, at that accreditation, uh, WINHEC board level. And I don't know because we're not, um, we, you know, we haven't, some of us have been to some of the WinHEC board meetings or even were there yeah, when yeah. it was birthed in, um, in Canada. And so for us to become more knowledgeable about the indigenous accreditation, mm -hmm. we need to have representation that, you know, mm -hmm. our people choose someone to represent us there. And it can be, I don't know if they'll accept, you know, seven of us from seven cultural regions because we're so diverse and so geographic. They would love that. Yeah, so if we had seven Alaskans, on WinHEC board, you know, imagine the, the um, you know, growth that we can have. Right. So 
So who do we approach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> think about it in terms of AFN. Oh, yeah. the three, the three big mm -hmm. I, we're speaking right now to IEASC. I don't know what it stands for, but it's the uh, accrediting board in Canada now has approved, the government has approved an indigenous accreditation for their higher ed mm -hmm. tribal colleges. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at WINHAC to be that vehicle. Mm -hmm. this, this is what I would, I was just, uh, after listening to you, I was like, hey. and so I think the idea is, so the University of Alaska is, has these sort of three big campuses, right? UAF, UAA, UAS. And then a couple years ago, maybe last year, I can remember, the schools of education all became one. It became the College of Education mm -hmm. under the University of Alaska. So I think what we should propose is the College of Alaska Native Languages, so that, like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in the School of Arts and Sciences at UAS anymore. I would be a faculty of the University of Alaska College of Alaska Native Languages. There, we could develop a certificate, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate program in teaching Indigenous languages, and then we can use it like WinHEC to get our certification processes, and then it. It would differ from Hawaii because it wouldn't be so culturally focused on one particular culture, but they would have to have would have to have fluence ways to measure fluency in each of their languages so that when they come in, they're ready. But this this would allow us to bypass this whole type M thing and this other type of certificate we're looking for because they spend uh, 18 months with us and get them to certify, and then they go into the school. And so I think. I think that and we'll talk tomorrow about how we can, what are the next big steps for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's potentially one of them. So we would have our own Dean Keiki Kikam work for us. I know I could pass for several. <laughs> but I don't know if my husband's going to be good with that one. Yota <laughs> told me, he says, you could pass for Hawaii. And then he pauses and he says, until you open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but so that, that's something we could talk about tomorrow, and, and then we would have, we could work directly with Glenn Hack so that we can get that certification process clarified, and we say, this is how we're doing it, and you guys just have to listen. And would, and would that be, uh, smaller tuition to pay for, 18 a month? So that's, that's a good question. I would have to examine how the tuition portion would work. Mm -hmm. It would probably be similar to getting a, a teacher certificate oh, right now. Okay. But there, there's certainly some things we can look at. I know another idea we're going to propose tomorrow is challenging the, the state government and the University of Alaska to figure out how to offer as many Alaska Native language courses as possible without tuition. Mm -hmm. We have one more, one more question, and then we'll call. Um, I'm wondering if you'll be able to cover any family, um, how you work with the family. Like for me, as a mom of emerging children and now grandmother of emerging children, um, it's very, very difficult, hard at home to maintain the language that I can teach at home because English is. English is everywhere. Yeah, it is. So are you able to oh. the family piece at all? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, Thursday presentation, I'm going to do a little focus about, around the family. And if you're still here, that might be a good conversation to sit in. I don't propose to have all the answers. I just have some experience I can share. I know it's a weakness in a program, in a language emerging in my Mm -hmm. And in the community. Yeah. 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 Ye